Thank you, Rabbi Simon, and thank you, Daniel, for a lovely introduction. I have to say that um, I uh, come to writing and doing research on Jewish themes rather late in my career, but I'm delighted to be here now doing it. Uh, I never wanted to write about myself, which is really why I started out looking at Spain first and then Latin America. But after a while, I realized that no matter what I was researching and writing, there was a piece of me in it. Um, so why not go all the way? <laughs> Today, uh, I'm talking to you about the Holocaust and the Dirty War. Uh, it's part of this research, this ongoing research project called, it, called Planting, Wheat, and Reaping Doctors, as Daniel said. Um, and this picture actually was a photograph. See, this, my husband Ken took some of the pictures that are, we'll see later, and they're framed much better. He thought he did this one, but no. And the reason you can tell is that it's very badly framed. But in any case, this is the door, or the gate to the Jewish cemetery, to the oldest Jewish, one of the oldest Jewish cemeteries, perhaps the oldest uh, in Argentina. It's the cemetery in, in Moisesville. And um, I won't be talking specifically about this. There are other talks and, and things that I've, I've been writing about it, but I thought it would be, it was, it's, it's a very, I think, a nice image of rural Jewish Argentina. Um, before I, I start reading from this paper, I would like to give you just a little bit of, of background. <laughs> Argentina historically uh, has had the largest Jewish population in Latin America. Um, in 2001, uh, it was estimated between 197,000 and 250,000 according to the World Jewish Population website. I don't do demography myself, so I have to look things up like this fast and dirty. Uh, the 210 update had that down to 182,000 and some. Um, earlier, though, in the 1960s, there were close to 500,000 Jews in, in Argentina. So the, um, one of the things that we've seen uh, lately is a diminishment in the number of Jews living in that country. Uh, but Jews began to come to Argentina in numbers um, at a, toward the end of the 19th century. Uh, Argentina, once it became independent, decided, at least its elites decided, that it would be a really good idea to become a, a, a European nation and to import as many European immigrants as they possibly could. And they started out with the sort of the high class ones, the, not the, the Protestant ones from places like Germany and England. And after a while, they started moving out to other parts of, of, of Europe, and eventually they got to the Jews. Uh, who were among the last groups to be recruited. In 1889, the, the good ship Vesta <coughs> leaves uh, Communist <coughs> Valencia and arrives in Buenos Aires. Um, a bunch of Jews had been recruited to come and they bought land. They bought land from, actually from the brother of one of the great writers in Argentina. And it turns out that the brother, I don't know about the writer himself, but the brother was not a very nice guy. And essentially um, abandoned these, these people, um, uh, didn't give them, give them the land that they paid for, and they wound up spending a very, very brutal winter abandoned in a railway station. Um, as a result of that, um, a Jewish agronomist who had been brought in to take a look at uh, the the situation and to, to talk about agronomy and to develop agriculture in Argentina, found these people, came across them, went back to Europe and uh, found a very rich man who had just lost his only son and had nobody to leave his money to, uh, and convinced him that a good, a good thing to do with his money would be to buy up land in Argentina and make it available to Jewish settlers. And that's what he did. That was the Baron von Hirsch. And um, there are many places in uh, Mosesville, which is actually named for him. Um, that, uh, that, that bear his name, and he's, he's remembered still to this day with a, a great deal of affection. Um, a lot of those Jews who first came to the countryside and populated these rural settlements eventually, as 
when Joe goes planted, we, we doctors and the next generation, the generations after that, uh, decided what they really wanted was an urban life, professional life, went off and, and were educated. Um, and as a result, what we see now in Argentina uh, are populations of Jews in the major cities as well as a few still left in, in the countryside. Um, in the, oh, I guess one more thing that I, I can tell you is that uh, the gates to Argentina closed in around 1938 to immigration. So what that meant was though uh, a good number of Jews actually managed to get into the country before 1938, and that's kind of after the immigration, the waves of immigration stopped in the United States. Uh, in 38 it stopped and, and there were many, many families who tried to get their, uh, their people out of Eastern Europe and Germany and were not able to do that. Uh, so there are, there are folks who's, uh, uh, in, who have living memories of families who are not able to, uh, to escape. Um, and of course, as, as you know, after the Second World War, Argentina became a haven for former Nazis. Um, and so we had both uh, Jews who had survived the camps, who had survived the Holocaust, uh, who at that point could come into Argentina very often because they had family members there, but at the same time, there's large influx of Nazis. So, um, so that's part of the stage setting for the talk to tonight. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, many Jews uh, who were involved in universities and professions, who were writers, psychoanalysts, some who were political and some were not, were um, caught up in the machinery that later became the machinery of the dirty war and the military dictatorship in Argentina that uh, lasted between 1976 and 1984. The, the numbers, uh, the best numbers, uh, people who were kidnapped, tortured, disappeared, who never returned, is about 30,000. Um, the population, the Jewish population in Argentina was just about 1% of the total population. The number or the percentage of Jews who were caught up, who were disappeared during the, the dirty war were approximately 10 to 12%. So there was a dis disproportionate number of Jews who, um, who were kidnapped, tortured, and killed at this time. Now, um, Jews were not targeted as Jews, as they were in the Holocaust. Right? They weren't targeted because they were Jews. But many were in what the military junta um, calls suspicious categories. People who were intellectuals, people who were students, uh, people who were writers people who were involved in, um, in social work, uh, in psychoanalysis. And so these categories were considered dangerous and were likely to be, um, to be part of those who, or the people who were in them were likely to be part of those who were rounded up and, uh, and disappeared. And as a result of that, uh, we see disproportionate number of, numbers of Jews um, who, were, who were caught up in this this mechanism. Um, so for many, you have to see I put on my glasses because now I'm gonna to start to read. Um, I don't wanna bore you with reading, but I also wanna do some. So for many of Argentina's Jews, uh, especially those who were directly affected by the state terror associated with this, the military of 76 to 84, the Holocaust resonates deeply with their own nation's dirty war. And dirty war was actually a term that the military itself uh, came up with the, the war against subversives, the people that they thought were subversives. One writer, uh, one Jew Jewish writer, Liliana Lukin, even says that the state terror practiced in Argentina during the dictatorship represents the perfecting of the Nazis' final solution. Another, the philosopher and novelist Jose Pablo Feynman, uh, who a uh, very pro prolific novelist, writes in one of his uh, novels, uses a narrator who um, says that geriatric facilities are a kind of concentration camp. 
and he compares them to both Nazi camps and Argentine torture centers. And I just want to read you a little bit. This is a quick and nerdy translation I did. Um, an old age home is something like a concentration camp. Maybe a lot, maybe a little, I can't say. In an old age home, there are no sadistic SS officers who enjoy the suffering of their victims. There aren't any officers of the Argentine Army, Navy, or Air Force. The old people in the homes aren't forced to work. They aren't tortured. They don't go to the gas chamber. And they aren't injected with sodium pentothal before getting shoved into a plane and, and dropped into the river plate. Now, what I think is interesting about this is that the counterpoint between the two varieties of camps in the passage establishes the connection between them. The difference here for this writer, or at least for this narrator, is not between Argentina under military dictatorship and Nazi Germany, but between these two kinds of death camps and the more benign nursing home. Now, for those of us outside Argentina, this comparison um, or the similarity that's, that's present here may first seem unacceptable. The Holocaust is unique. And to enlist it to describe another set of circumstances is to diminish its horror. This is something that we all feel, that we all know. The purpose of the Nazi camps was genocide. And as brutal and as deadly and even as anti-Semitic as the Argentine prisons were, they did not have as their aim the eradication of a people. Nevertheless, the Daya, the delegation of Argentine Jewish associations, easily the most mainstream of Jewish organizations in Argentina, and one that actually hoped to appease the junta during the time uh, of the dictatorship, now calls the junta's actions genocide. Like the Nazis, the dictatorial Argentine state used metaphors of contagion to justify the removal of those they considered dangerous and undesirable. They likened the body politic to the human body, riddled with disease that needed to be rooted out. And they reduced their, inter their internal enemy that they themselves invented to the level of the subhuman. Argentinians used the term concentration camp to, to describe the detention centers created to isolate this perceived threat to the authoritarian state, um, to, uh, to separate them out from those who actually accepted this notion of, of the model citizen. Um, so in short, the junta adopted a variety of techniques of state terror that were, were perfected by the Nazis. And I disagree with Luke, and I think the Nazis did a pretty good job of perfecting it themselves. Um, but they deliberately and they consciously evoked Nazi practices, even though they used somewhat different uh, technologies of death. Tapping into an undercurrent of anti-Semitism in national culture, the Junta brought a military ethos that deeply admired Nazi practice to the prosecution of the dirty war. And they did it in a way that was more pronounced when its victims were Jewish. And that uh, was done also in a way that was not necessarily visible to non-Jews. Not surprisingly, then, Jewish writers and artists are the ones who show how the campaign against so-called so subversives during the Dirty War incorporated Nazi te techniques and practices. For Jewish Argentine writers like Manuela Fingeret, the Holocaust serves as a template for understanding the state uh, terror of the Dirty War. And I'm going to come back to Fingeret later. She's going to be my main uh, example here. Testimonial writing by Jews such as Alicia Pardnoy and um, Nora Strekilevich, uh, and also Jacobo Timmerman, as well as the testimony of Jews collected in documents like Mugamas, Never Again, whose very title recalls the Shoah, and the collection of remembrances by Jewish disappeared <coughs> in a single Buenos Aires neighborhood, attest to the anti-Semitic slurs and Nazi symbols, techniques, and language that accompanied their abduction, imprisonment, and torture center, sent sessions. Sorry. According to the Dyer Report, Jews were disappeared in numbers representing at least five times their proportion of the population. And as I said before, other, most other estimates are higher. Um, once Jews were caught in the machinery of disappearance and torture, they were targeted for special treatment. And the Dyer Report breaks those down into the following categories. The first, anti-Semitic actions at the time, the moment of abduction and detention. The second, specific types of torture and humiliation inflicted on Jews during their stay in, con in these concentration camps. Third, the use of Nazi language, terminology, or symbols. 
fourth special interrogation for Jews, um, and fifth, the illegal appropriation of assets and extortion. And the last uh, was actually uh, perpetrated on many people uh, who were not Jewish as well. Some of these practices were limited to Jews for obvious reasons, but one of the results of differential treatment of Jewish prisoners is the reinforcement of them, uh, for them for, of the links between their own experience and the Holocaust, uh, even as such a connection might not exist for Gentile prisoners. Um, and one of the outcomes of this is that Jewish prisoners have different recollections uh, of their experiences to present in their, the narratives uh, for those who survived. Uh, so, the dirty war was more like the Holocaust for Jewish victims uh, of it because the victimizers made sure that it would be. The result is an after effect that augments Jewish difference and even threatens to feed into uh, the current anti-Semitic narrative that holds that Jews are overly invested in the Holocaust. The testimony in Nazi discourse of Jewish survivors of the dirty war demonstrates that the connection between the Holocaust and the dictatorship originated with the junta itself. In the little school, uh, one of the first of these to come out, um, at least the little school was the name of one of the torture centers. The writer uh, and uh, survivor, Alicia Portnoy, um, tells about her months of detention and torture. And she says that her writers, uh, that her captors threatened to turn her into soap. And what she does is she makes fun of their threat. Um, what she says is that they just didn't have the technology to do it. So there's a kind of black humor that runs through Partnoy's work that's really quite unusual and quite wonderful. Um, she makes fun of the threat, and as a non-practicing Jew, she found it finds their recourse to Nazi-like threats anachronistic and absurd. Another Jewish uh, victim of the junta, Nora Strechilevich, like Partnoy, wrote about her experience as one of the disappeared in a text that blends memory with fiction in a novel called The Single Numberless Death. And I'm showing these because they're actually ones that are available in English, so if people want to go out and find them there, you can. In her first encounter with the thugs who kidnapped her, um, Strechilevich yells her name so that any witnesses will know who it is that's been taken. That was common practice among people who were being disappeared. Her abductors hear her cry out Strechilevich and then accuse her of speaking in some secret Jewish code that they can't understand. Um, the photographer Marcelo Brodsky is probably best known for an exhibit and book called Good Memory, Buena Memoria. This is the cover of the book. It's a collection of altered photographs whose centerpiece, centerpiece is an annotated school photo, photograph with some of the faces circled, as you can see, some of them circled and crossed out. Those are people who were killed. Um, and the photo, which is surrounded in the text uh, and in the rest of the book and in the exhibit that it comes from, surrounded by others that really recall the innocent daily life of his disappeared brother and their friends. And it seems to me that this, uh, this presentation is reminiscent of post-war exhibits and books of photographs of Jewish life in Eastern Europe before the Shoah. And like them, Brodsky's photos also bear the weight of subsequent history. Brodsky turns the, fo the photo into the story of the dictatorship, in which some of the faces, like that of his own brother, were disappeared, while others led or ordinary lives. As viewers, we look at these individualized faces, almost all of them Jewish, and Brodsky's annotations compel us to remember the stories of those who fell victim to the dictatorship. Brodsky has a less well-known work, but one that's probably been seen by more people, uh, at least in Argentina. It juxtaposes a, uh, a photograph taken in Germany of a memorial naming Nazi concentration camps, and I hope this will take me back. No, I'm sorry. Oh. So you can, this is the, the photograph that he takes that's part of the, ins, the installation, and I'll go back to the other one. But you can see this is taken in Berlin, and, um, and it's a memorial in Germany that names concentration camps. And he does that juxtaposed, I'm oh, sorry, juxtaposed with a, an actual physical sculpture, actually, 
that copies that monument with a list of the concentration camps of the disappeared in, in Argentina. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, between the image and its copy is a wall, and you can see that, that yellow wall, on which the title of these pieces are mounted, the camps one and the camps two, cementing the link between them. Um, the, this work is permanently exhibited in the courtyard of the Recoleta Cultural Center. It's an open access art space visited by thousands of people each year. So people walk by this and they see this. So although the other work is more famous internationally, this one is very, very present uh, for people who live in Buenos Aires and walk through this free open space. Unlike Brodsky, who is best known for artwork that is overtly political, Guillermo Puica underplays uh, his, uh, his work's political and Jewish content. Still, uh, I'm going to show you this very quickly and then zip by it because I don't have permission to show it. Um, I tried to get it and I couldn't from the museum. Um, so keep that in, in your head. We'll, come, uh, we'll get back to Daughters of Silence, Daughter of Silence soon. Uh, but Quica uh, has a few canvases that reflect on his family's migration from the Ukraine to Argentina. And one takes the Jewish cemetery in Buenos Aires as its point of reference. Uh, Kuitka, who is one of the rising stars in the international art world, had a one-man show at the Walker last year. I don't know if people had a chance to, to see it. It's quite wonderful. Um, and in it were a group of worn mattresses, like the one that I just showed you, imprinted with imaginary maps of East, ma imaginary maps, mostly of Eastern Europe. And that I at least couldn't see as anything but echoes of the displacement during the Holocaust. Uh, and he also had one single small image that bore the title 30,001, a reference, I'm sure, to the number of disappeared during the Dirty War. The juxtaposition of these works by an artist who, in the uh, context of the Walker exhibit anyway, was scrubbed pretty clean of his Argentineity and of his Jewishness, perhaps in the cause of presenting him as truly cosmopolitan, mainstream, and important artist without pesky third world and Jewish baggage, function for me at least as a secret signal to the crossed histories of the state terror that I've been talking about here. Now, now I want to turn to the novel by Manuela Figueret. And as, again, this is one of many, but this actually has been translated recently into English by Donald uh, Lockhart. Um, Donald, no, Daryl Lockhart, who is a scholar of, art, of uh, Latin American Jewish literature. Uh, the, the novel is called Daughter of Silence, and it's by Manuela Figueret, who writes poetry as well as fiction. The narrator in this novel is a young woman named Rita, who tells her story of militancy, capture, and imprisonment in the Argentina of the 1970s. At the same time, she tries to reconstruct her mother's experience, first in the Minsk ghetto, then in Terezin, and during her transport to Auschwitz. The novel's structure establishes the interrelationship of the two devastating <laughs> historical events. One is the story of Rita held in the Naval Mechanics School, which was a notorious torture center used by the military in the 70s and 80s, <coughs> right in the middle of Buenos Aires. And while she was there, uh, while she's there, the character Rita struggles to piece together uh, her mother's story in relation to her own. Rita is isolated, she's blindfolded, and she's being tortured. Interspersed among these uh, pieces is also the story of Rita's whole maternal line, uh, which soon enough becomes the story of her mother, Tinkala. Tinkala never tell, had, has never told her story of, of the camps and of survival to Rita. Like many real life survivors, she buried her past in silence, leaving her daughter to try to make sense of her mother's past by stitching together partial, suppressed stories, overheard in snatches, sometimes in a half-understood language. Silence is the operative term in the novel captured in its title. And, uh, but particular silence didn't mask or hide the reality of the Holocaust for her child. The effects of her trauma reemerged in Rita. But Tinkala's trauma is transmitted extra-linguistically, 
and Rita's knowledge of the details of the Holocaust comes from other so sources, from reading histories, from reading other people's writings, from seeing photographs, from looking, at, looking for documents. So Rita re struggles to reconstruct the history of her mother, her grandmother, her great-grandmother, precisely because the Holocaust was the great silencer. Tinka <coughs> held her story not only of her suffering in Terezin, but also the disturbing knowledge that she found a kind of happiness there in the form of an intense, uh, an intense friendship, the intellectual stimulation of classes with brilliant teachers, the poetry and music that others made, and her own development as a visual artist. Um, needless to say, all of this produces a great amount of guilt in Tinkala. You're not supposed to have any good memories of, of being in a concentration camp. And then Tinkala survives by a combination of determination, good luck, and the intellectual and aesthetic nourishment made, made available by the clandestine study groups and the music and the art and the writing uh, that the prisoners in the camp managed to organize. But like many real life survivors, she could not or would not tell her story to her child. Rita's dilemma is the dilemma of what theorists like Mariana Hirsch have called post memory. And Leslie Morris, who's sitting here, has also written cogently and wonderfully and brilliantly about post memory. The effect of the on the children of Holocaust survivors of their parents' tormented years in, concentra in the concentration camps. Post-memory, Hirsch explains, this, quote, describes the relationship that the generation after those who witnessed cultural or collective trauma, trauma bears to the experiences of those who came before, experiences that they remember only by means of the stories, images, and behaviors among which they grew up. But these experiences were transmitted to them so deeply and effectively as to seem to constitute memories in their own right. That's the end of the quote. An Argentinian psychoanalyst named Aleda Asman says that families affected by the Shoah don't share real memories, but instead they transmit emanations in what she calls a chaos of emotion. In Daughter of Silence, once Rita is kidnapped and taken from her family, part of her strategy of survival is to sort out the chaos of emotion of post-memory and tell herself her mother's story. She is not able to create a coherent narrative of her own torture, her own isolation, her own sensory deprivation, which are happening in the present moment for, a, for her. Her own story comes to her and to us in waves, recollections of friends, of reflections on her past, brief references to her current so, uh, circumstances, the occasional snatch of a prayer or the snatch of a nursery rhyme. All of that is entirely chaotic. The one place that she comes to some kind of coherence is ironically in telling her mother's story. Another uh, Argentine daughter of survivors, Diana Rahm, understands the silence of collective trauma particularly of the Holocaust as a survival mechanism. And what she points out is that because collective trauma is an outcome of state terror, its victims learn that the authorities won't protect those who speak out. Quite the opposite. It's not at all surprising that those who suffer from uh, state-inflicted trauma will not speak. It's too dangerous to do that. So Finneret narrates Tinkala's story of Teretzin precisely to break that perfectly understandable but also debilitating silence. When her novel came out, it was touted as the first piece of fiction in Argentina to discuss Teretzin. Notes at the end of the novel tell us that the details of the, at least one chapter are de derived from an historical account of the camp and that the poetry cited in the text was written by uh, prisoners in Teretzin who appear in the text as minor characters. In other words, at the same time that the Holocaust gives shape and resonance to the state terror of the Dirty War, the Dirty War provides an entryway to the preservation of the memory of the Holocaust. Rita is the daughter of silence. Fingeret, her creator, breaks that silence. But within the novel, Tinkala's silence makes it impossible for Rita to speak. And there's a, a very, very moving passage in the novel where uh, the daughter finds the the cloth yellow star that her mother wore and touches it and realizes that she's broken a terrible taboo, feels that she has to wash her hands, clean herself of it, and she never, never says anything about it to her mother at all. 
Um, so she takes in this terrible, uh, this terrible knowledge without being a, into her body, without being able to, to talk about it. She knows that she's been incorporated into a secret that she was not intended to penetrate, but that she is part of. Um, the uh, Fingerit's novels I, uh, serve as what I want to call a prosthetic memory that addresses the deliberate suppression of memory after the dictatorship. Weaving the story of the Holocaust into the story of kidnapping, torture, and <coughs> unconfirmed death is a way of tying it into history and making it understandable, not only to, the pe to people inside Argentina, but th to those of us outside. So unlike post memory, which is incorporated really almost without, uh, without overt knowledge, prosthetic memory feels smashed on, pressed on to the, to the body politic, to people who need to know and who have been avoiding knowledge. Um, for the artist Mirza Kupfernik, um, here you see her with her mother, the most Jewishly identified of the artists and writers that I'm talking about, at least in terms of her own artwork, the events of the dictatorship barely leave a trace in the work. Like Figueret, uh, who is a friend of Kupfernik's, and they actually did a, a, an installation together, Kupfernik was a child of survivors who grew up, she says, and this is a picture of an embraced by tattooed arms. I don't have time to talk about Kupernik's work at length, but I do want to show you a few images uh, to give you an idea of her engagement with her parents' experience of the Shoah and how it resonates as post memory with her. And you can see the, the tattoo on the mother's arm. Um, this is one of her pieces called Wandering, uh, people carrying literally carrying their roots with them. Uh, and they're wrapped, one is wrapped in a talis, one of them is carrying what seems to me to be an image of Jerusalem. In others of this series, people carry Torah scrolls. Uh, so that's one of them. This is her piece called Ghost in the Lord's Ghetto uh, that she did, her father was in Lutz, uh, and it's a piece that she did when she learned uh, that her father had had a family before uh, he met and married her mother in Argentina after both of them came to uh, the new, this new country and that she had a, a baby brother who died that she had never known about. Um, this is part of an installation. This is a picture again of her mother uh, in a winged chair sitting uh, juxtaposed to a much tattooed young man in which uh, uh, uh rehearses the meaning of the tattoo on the body. Um, in this installation, people would come in and get a tattoo on their arm, and some of them, and they would pick at random what they would get, and some of them got numbers, and some of them got decoration. Um, this is another piece that she did. This is actually uses the image of the artist's hand overlaid with a very gauzy cloth and then embroidery, which is also very important to her work, connecting her with her mother's, uh, her mother's story. And it uh, shows, this, it's called Heartline, and three places are Luz, Zadosh, and Buenos Aires, where her father came from, where her mother came from, and then where they wound up. So this is the, the migration out of uh, the experience of the Shoah. And then um, finally, uh, this is a monument that, uh, that Kupfer made uh, to the victims of the attack on the Jewish community center, the Amia. Uh, Brodsky also did one of these, uh, but this is, this is one of the few places where Kupfer Right, uh, right, uh, makes political art. Um, interestingly, though, uh, even though her, her work doesn't address the dirty war, it's been read that way. And I think that it's important for us to think about not only what it means, for what the artist is doing, but how the work is received. Um, so this is, this is the piece. 
It's called to be a witness, and it's a detail. You can see this is the detail of it. And this is the whole piece. Um, this is what Kupfermink says about this. I intended this piece to represent the Shema, taking note that the installation also includes the two letters, Ayin, which is the last letter of the first word of the prayer, and Dal, the last letter of the last word. Joining the two letters creates the word Ayin, the Hebrew word for witness. But when the observer learns that I am Argentinian, sees the image of a man covering his eyes, and learns that the piece is titled, piece's title is to be a witness. The assumption is that the image is a reflection on dictatorship and the disappeared people in Argentina during the 1970s. So, um, so here we come full circle. Unlike Figueret, who is her friend, or Brodsky, or Feynman, who deliberately bring together the Holocaust and the dirty war in their work, Kupfernick, much of whose work does deal with the Shoah, makes an image that is deeply Jewish, that in her mind did not engage either of the two 20th century horrors that marked Jewish <coughs> Argentina, but that is read in terms of her history as an Argentine. So I want you to look at this image, and I think that um, it's, it's important for us to think about how it was read and how she thinks it should be read. But take a look at this. Uh, actually, it's, this is, Hands photograph. This is a memorial to the disappeared in Buenos Aires that um, was taken, the photograph was taken in the year 2000. And what you see here is image after image of faces of young, mostly young people who were disappeared. And so when you look at this up close, you have these squares of faces, not people who refuse to look, not that are people who are meant to bear witness, but those about whom witness needs to be born. And I think that what the viewer of this sees is an image of that. That these images of, of these faces that uh, are put up and then taken down over and over again, really, and have been since the end of, of the dirty war, may in some way have crept into Here's a Kupernik's mind when she was creating this image, even though it was not anything that she had intended. So I will leave you with this image to be a witness, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.